church in Carlinville, uh, where we came from. And I really made a very deep and spiritual connection with Doug that, that first time we got to really spend time together because we had shared some barbecue together. And I, I, I learned how much Doug and now his wife Kim uh, love barbecue. And you can't not like a brother when they have a bond like that with you over something so special as uh, slow-smoked meat. Um, anyway, but Doug uh, has, uh, how, how long have you been with uh, Baptist Foundation now? Five years. Okay, so he hadn't been there very long, but it's been amazing what God has done through Doug and how uh, he has really blessed Illinois Baptists and the Baptist Foundation of Illinois uh, through Brother Doug. So anyway, as I've said for several weeks now, Doug is here today to uh, share God's word with us and then immediately following a lunch and then uh, share a seminar uh, with us. So at this time, Brother Doug, would you come on up and, and share God's word with us? Thank you, Brother, for everything. I appreciate you. Thank you, Brother Kurt, and I uh, uh, know, obviously, that it's fitting that most Baptist bonding does occur over food some, some, somehow. It's, it's uh, um, amazing how that, how that works, and, and, and you know, it's, it, it's interesting, while we are, we have had the ability to uh, take that, that culinary culture into every area, whether we're in the north or the midsection or the south, and, and uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is typically by our potluck we are known uh, around the country. Um, we're going to turn to Matthew 25 in, in just a moment, um, but while you're turning there, I, I have to tell you a little bit about what you're going to experience uh, this was not the first time Jesus said this. In fact, this particular um, phrase, uh, this particular uh, uh, series of words, uh, it, it was so common for Jesus that almost everywhere he went, and, and particularly it's recorded multiple times in Matthew, almost everywhere he went he would use this particular phrase. He would say something like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he'd fill in the blank. The kingdom of heaven is like this or like that. In fact, some of the sayings that you're probably familiar with, most all of them from Matthew, some of them we still remember. I, 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 if, if you've been following uh, Christ any length of time at all, and if you have even a passing reading, particularly of Matthew, you'll recognize some of those stories. Uh, one time he said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman put in just a part of the dough, and before long it leavened the entire loaf. And if you'll think about that for just a moment, we recognize the truth of that, that once Christ gets into a part of our life, what happens? All of our life very quickly changes, doesn't it? One time, he said more famously uh, still, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant that finds a pearl of great price, and when he finds that, he goes and sells all that he has just so he can go buy that one pearl. And again, we recognize the truth of that, don't we? That once we understand what our relationship with God means through Christ, once we appreciate Jesus paid it all, once amazing grace, my chains are gone, produces tears in our eyes, once we come to that place in our life, we understand the truth of that, don't we? That everything else could be sold just so we could purchase that one thing. That's how valuable it is. One time, in fact, one of my favorite instances where Jesus is speaking and using that phrase, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. <laughs> now, that's a different kind of phrase. Uh, my wife and I were traveling just a few years ago up in, uh, up in northern Indiana, up in Amish country, and we, we, we saw a whole tub, a whole uh, container of mustard seeds, and they're really, really, very, very small. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. He said, although it's the smallest of all the seeds, 
yet when it's planted, it produces a tree, almost a, a bush, so large that the birds can even come and build a nest in its branches. And again, if we think about that, what the world sees as small and insignificant, when the Spirit of God gets involved, it can be huge and transformative, can't it? I mean, I mean, who would have thought that 12 guys with questionable social skills would start a church that would change the world? <laughs> there, there, there is something about God's math that mystifies the world, isn't there? Well, this time he's speaking again, and even by Jesus' standards, he says something radical, <laughs> and that's saying something. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to look at the mid part of, of, of that chapter, but, but before we get into that chapter, I'm going to caution you, there are a series of statements in that in that chapter that are just before the passion of Christ. In fact, you may even remember the very last story in that, in that, uh, uh, in that chapter uh, right after that. Verse 31 begins, do, 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 do you know that story about the sheep and the goats? Where Jesus says, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It, it, it's like a shepherd separating out the sheep from the goats. Again, he's talking about end times things. Well, right now, Jesus in verse 14 is going to begin talking about something even more radical for us, I think, in particular. He really talks about stewardship. And when he talks about stewardship, I have to recognize that when we're talking about stewardship in the church, we oftentimes have some, can, can I say it like this, so, some baggage with us. It's, it's interesting, stewardship is a difficult, and, and when, when we talk about stewardship, I'm particularly talking about financial management. It, it, is a, it is a difficult topic to talk about in the church, largely because I think that it's been made so. For surely the Bible talks about stewardship and financial management all throughout its pages. In fact, we'll even talk about this a little bit in the seminar this afternoon. Matthew 6.33 literally points to um, th that, that, that whole area where he's talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. He says very clearly where your heart and your, and, and your treasure are, are the same place. It's amazing the number of times that stewardship is talked about. But the world doesn't always hear that. In fact, in the church, sometimes we have difficulty hearing that. L let me get you guys to kind of talk back to me a little bit with that. You're probably aware, kind of, kind of fill in the blank. You've probably heard people say, well, I'm not going to that church because all they want is my money. It's interesting, isn't it? How, how somehow we've messed up the message, somehow that we've equated it with getting or giving money when that's simply one of the huge elements of what stewardship is all about. Well, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, really begins to put it into context. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read this text to you. For it will be like a man, just like a man, going on a journey. And again, that it there refers to the kingdom of heaven sayings. It will be just like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents. Now, don't let that throw you. A talent here is a unit of most likely gold uh, in, 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 in that culture, uh, gold, sometimes you'll see it's in silver, but it's worth about $60,000 a piece okay, in, in, in modern money, okay? And so when we begin to think about this, understand that this is a subsistence culture, right? They are very much having to pray, Lord, give us our daily bread, not Lord, bless us as we go through the drive through at McDonald's. Uh, their, their, their thinking is going to be different. And so when they see this kind of number in front of them, it would have been, wow, that's incredible amount of wealth. Okay? 
to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability, what the perceived ability to manage was. And then he went away. And he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent, he went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents, he came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Now, I I want you to look how, how honest and real he gets with this verse. Look very carefully. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you've scattered no seed. And by the way, it's kind of a cue. Anytime a conversation starts with, I know you're a tough guy, it's probably not going to go well. But his, uh, excuse me, so I was afraid and I went And I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful, read lazy, servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers, so that at my coming I would have received what was my own with interest." So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Would you pray with me? Father, help us to hear clearly. Help us to put aside the distractions that might cause us not to hear clearly. But Father, if we're honest, we've heard before. If we're honest, we've seen before. If we're honest, we've worshipped before. Father, may this encounter with your word be different somehow. May we respond in a way that goes to the core of who we are. May our hearts always be broken and reformed upon the good news of your word. We love you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, uh, and in my prayer I was, I was alluding to this, have you ever noticed how we oftentimes hear and read the Bible with somewhat of a filter? We, 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 we have words and stories that get through that filter a little bit more easily than others. Uh, we, we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus a little bit more easy than, Lord, you really challenge me in deep places. Have you noticed that? It is, it is, it is, it is much more easy for most of us to sit in places where we're comforted more than convicted. 
it's interesting because this text is one of those that has what the old Baptist preacher Vance Havner would have said, hard doctrine in it. This is tough words. I mean, I mean, how, how on earth do you get this kind of text where you're, you're, you're seeing a picture of, of end times, you're seeing a picture of accountability, you're seeing a picture of stewardship at the highest level, and you get this picture of these people that have been stewards. And by the word, way, the, the word steward literally means manager. That's all it means. How do you go from two guys that, you know, heard the master say, well done, good job, way to go, to you worthless, wicked servant, throw the bum out of here? How do you do that in just a, just a short few verses? It's amazing to me. Well, I, I really think the, the, the answer is to understand, first off, what they had in common. Because those three stewards, those three managers, they actually had some things in common. And, and then there's one thing that they did very, very different from, from each other. And we'll talk about that in just a, just a moment. But, but let's, let's first talk about a couple of things they had in common. Number one, number one all three of them seemed to understand that what they were managing belonged to someone else. Did, did you notice that? I mean, there, there, there wasn't any issues of title and registration here. They didn't wake up one day and say, oh, look what I've got. I've got a, it's all these talents of, of gold and money, and they're all mine, and so I'm going to do whatever I want to with them. None of them did that. They all seem to understand what we've heard in the past, oftentimes in the church, that God owns it all. The master owned what they managed. They seem to get that. They seem to understand what the psalmist reminded us early on, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and everything in the earth. If you're counting, that's about 100%. <laughs> In other words, all of it belongs to God. Now that's made especially true. They understood where that money, where that talent that they were managing, they understood that it belonged to the master. It wasn't theirs. Now, if you truly believe that, if you're a believer, if you're someone who's been walking with the Father for a while, and you really believe that what you manage, everything that you manage, all of it, the moments in your calendar to the dollars in your checking account, if you believe that all that you manage belongs to the Lord, understand that the world thinks you're nuts. Right? I mean, because, let's face it, we live in a culture, don't we, where bigger is better, where flashier is what we're driven to. I mean, I mean, just just some time, uh, put on the TV and 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 and, and don't not necessarily for the content of what's there, but just watch the commercials for just a moment. I guarantee there's not nine uh, there, the, the, that ninety percent of what's being advertised is something that you don't need. And yet, billions and billions and billions of dollars are designed to help literally put salt in the water of the culture so that we desire more and more. I, uh, I, I oftentimes tell this story, um, and, and I always chuckle, particularly when my, when, when my wife is here with me. Um, I, 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 I was... I, I would tell people that I grew up in the 1970s, and that's usually the part that I chuckle at because my wife would tell you that I have never grown up in any decade. Um, but, but, but I remember a, a, a T-shirt that was popular at the time, and, and, and you may have seen it. it. It said, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> and of course, even then I knew how stupid that was because he who dies with the most toys is still dead. I mean, there's a reason, isn't there, that, that, that there's not a lot of storage facilities next to cemeteries. Have you noticed that? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that what people think they own, they simply are able to manage for a very brief period of time. A very brief 
window of time in which they have an opportunity to manage what it is that they have in front of them. In fact, you exit life every time with the exact same balance sheet you come in with. Have you noticed that? I remember my wife and I, oh, the Lord has <laughs> taught us and then he's given us a lot of remedial education along the way. But I, I remember one of the times in which he, he, he taught us a little bit about this was when we were purchasing our, our first home together. We were purchasing a home in which we uh, went in. I, I, was, I, I was pastoring my, 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 my second church, and I was going to seminary at the time, and I was teaching at the time, and I was doing all kinds of things there. It was a crazy season in our life. But, but we purchased our first home together, and, uh, I, and we went in, and, and, the, and, and the attorney where we did the closing for the house had, had a chain of title in there. And I'll, that was before they did little abstracts where they just kind of abstracted the, the, the title with a, a short narrative. With a chain of title, you had the entire thing. You had when it was built, who, who, who financed it, who released it, who bought it next, and, and the whole thing. And, and, and it was kind of interesting because my wife and I figured out pretty early on that we were going to be in that chain of title, and it wasn't going to be very long till somebody else would be in that chain of title. We live in a home built in 1867 now. we got a long chain of title, and sure enough, there will be someone coming after us. It doesn't take very long before you realize that all the energy that the world puts into trying to control what they own is a little silly because very shortly they won't own anything. Truly, the psalmist was right Everything belongs to the Lord. Truly, these three stewards, they got it. Everything they managed belonged to the manager, to, to the owner. Everything they managed belonged to the master that had given it to them in the first place. And, and, and I don't know if you're to that place this morning, and I hope you are, where you begin to understand that, wait a second, the, the amount of time that I have on the planet... The resources that I manage, all of it, and, and please, if, if we dare poor mouth, let's remember that if we can flip a switch and get electricity or turn a spigot and get water, that we're wealthier than about 90% of the globe. All that we manage belongs to the master, not to us. It does cause us to think and to even speak more differently. I, in fact, it was kind of interesting. My, I, I, I kind of had this put to the test in, in, in my own life. Um, I had to, had to replace a car uh, last year, and my wife and I were sitting in the, uh, the, the, the Honda dealership, and, 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 we're, and we're sitting there, and, and I literally stopped to pray to say, Lord, this is a lot of money, and this is your money. Is this the right thing to do? I got, I got, if, if I can be confessional with you, when I was a kid, I would have done that. When I was a kid, if I had the resources on hand, I would have done what I wanted to do. You see, that's what stewardship causes you to begin to think. It suddenly begins to make us question our toys. It suddenly begins to make us think, is this a wise investment of God's money, not mine? Because our bank account is really God's bank account. Our house is really God's house. Our time is really God's time. And it causes all these questions that we ask about how we personally live our lives to be very different. First, they all understood the master owned it all. Secondly, it seems clear that all those three stewards... They all understood that the master was coming back somehow. They all three got it, that the master was going away into a country, and then he was coming back. And i got to tell you, one of, I think, the most helpful things for a Christian manager to remember is that to understand that, wait a second, this string doesn't go on forever. 
wait a second, we need to understand that at some point there is an ending to this. And according to the text that we just read, one of the first questions that he's going to have for you and for me is, what did you do with my stuff? (laughs) What did you do with what I gave you to manage? What did you do with the talents that I gave you to manage? What did you do with the time that I gave you to manage? And certainly, particularly in America, what did you do with the resources I gave you to manage? What did you do with those things? Understanding that there is a moment coming of accountability in which we have a sit down with the Father. And He says, You know what? I gave you these years, I gave you these resources. What did you do with all of those? I think is one of the most helpful things that a Christian ever does. In fact, I can tell you that one of the most, in my opinion, helpful Psalms is toward the latter, latter third of the book. It's Psalm 90. And, and, and you may not know anything else about Psalm 90, but, but I will tell you that it's a little bit unique because it's a psalm that's attributable to Moses. Moses, that, that's, that's pretty old. And it says something like this. Moses is praying in along, and he says, Lord, teach me to number my days so that I might be wise upon the earth. That's pretty heavy. Teach us to understand that I won't be here forever, and therefore the stewardship of what I've got matters. It matters deeply, and it's something that ought to evoke passion in us. One of the most helpful things that uh, one of my New Testament professors said when I was a when I was a kid in school, uh, Joe Lunsford, he was, uh, I thought he was old at the time. He was, uh, oh, he was 60 or something like that. And so I just thought he was ancient. Of course, I, I can assure you that I never, I, I don't think that anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, Joe, Joe Lunsford came in one time and all these 19, 20-year-old kids, he, he uh, said, said at the time, he said, Jesus is coming back, he said. And then he looked at that classroom and he said, you know what? But he may be coming back for me before he comes back for you. And there's a couple of you here that have as much gray hair as I do. I'm starting to appreciate the truth of that. Jesus is coming back. I don't know whether that appointment is going to occur at his place when he calls me home or our place when he calls all of us together. I don't know which will occur first, but I do know that 100% of the time that appointment's going to occur, that Jesus is going to come back. And according to what we just read, one of the moments of accountability that I'll have with the Father is, Lord, here's what I did with what you gave me. And it seems to me that true stewardship drives us toward that realization. And that's where they diverged. I told you there were a couple places in which they were in common, right? They, they were those, those three stewards, they, they, they were in sync with each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, that they understood that the master owned it all. And secondly, they understood the master was coming back. But here's where they really diverged. Here's where they really had a difference. In fact, we can hear it in the words that the master spoke to them, right? Steward number one, five talents. He comes in to the master and says, look, master, here's what happened. Uh, You gave me five talents. Thank you for doing that. And I, 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 I traded with it. I worked with it. and I'm giving you back five talents more. That's not a dull stewardship sermon, folks. What that means is that there's this day in which we're going to stand in front of the Father and we're going to say, Lord, here's what you gave me to work with and here's what I did with it and I'm giving that back to you. He responds with, well done. That was exactly what I was hoping you would do. I don't know about you, but that's kind of the message I'm hoping to hear. Well done. Way to go. Well played. You did a great job. Steward number two comes in. Two talents. Same story. Here's what you gave me. Here's what I'm returning back to you. Same response. And steward number three, in fact, I pointed it out in verse 25 when we read it together. He was afraid. 
And the problem that I've always had with this story is, is, is right here. Steward number three thought he was playing it safe. Steward number three thought he was okay. He thought everything was, was working out. That was the tragedy of this, is that because he comes up there and literally what he's saying to the master is, look, I didn't want to expose you to any risk. <laughs> Therefore, I buried it in the ground and did nothing. And if I could be real with you just a moment, he reminds me a whole lot of religious people in general, and sometimes Baptist in particular, in that it's not like he did anything crazy. You notice this is not a prodigal son kind of guy, right? I mean, he didn't run off to a far country and squander his wealth and riots his living. That, that, that's not him. He didn't do a whole lot of crazy stuff. In fact, he was pretty boring. And, and honestly, we're pretty boring. And if you don't think you're boring, ask your neighbor. They'll tell you you're boring. What he did wasn't a whole lot of crazy stuff. What he did was a whole lot of nothing. And if we're honest, we followers of God are oftentimes pretty good at doing a whole lot of nothing. You see, stewardship is not a passive activity. Stewardship is not just waiting back and hoping that we have a little bit more money than month. Stewardship is not an activity in when it says, Lord, I just hope to get through. Stewardship was never designed to be an activity of maybe we can just ride this out. Stewardship was always meant to be an exciting moment <coughs> in which we understand truly that what God has given us is a gift and an opportunity to do something awesome for the kingdom. Stewardship was a moment in which we understand that truly the kingdom of heaven is like that because it means that we are all in for the benefit of the kingdom. I oftentimes tell this story, um, and I, I, I'm always glad that she's not here when I tell this. This is our, our, our eldest child who is a competitive swimmer. And uh, Lauren, our, if, if you know me well enough, uh, well, that my wife and I have three adoptive children. We have two children we adopted from Russia back in 98, and one child domestically in 2001. Well, the, the girls were pretty good swimmers. In fact, the youngest just signed a contract with the Navy to, in the Special Forces to be an air rescue swimmer. So she's, she's doing a lot of that. And the eldest was not very fast off the block, but she had good endurance. She could swim forever. I, and I remember the very, very first uh, sectional uh, that we went to with Lauren, we took her over to Champagne, and uh, we were in the pool over there, and, and she was in the 500 meter event, and, and, and in our size pools in, in Illinois, that's, that's, that's 20 laps back and forth. I mean, you, we were worn out just watching the thing. And we noticed something that occurred. At the end of the race, Lauren kind of came in the middle of the pack. And she got to the end, and she wasn't even breathing hard. And she pulled herself up out of the, out of the pool, and, and, and we went down off the observation deck, and we, and we were talking to her. And, and she said, she said, Daddy, she said, there's so much more I could have done. And it occurs to me that the thing in my life that honestly frightens me the most is standing in front of the one who died to buy me, knowing there's more I could have done. Stewardship, it occurs to me, is never meant to be a spectator sport. 
It is meant to say, Lord, I am all in with everything that I've got. And so it causes me to think differently about ownership. It causes me to think differently about the Lord returning. And it causes me to think differently about, Lord, let me live every moment of every day with everything that I manage focused upon you. If we do that, then no longer will we hear the stories of, I'm not going down to that church because all they want is my money. A Christian would respond, what money? We don't have any. That's the Lord's. He lets us use some of it to take care of ourselves and some of it to take care of our families and others of it we get the privilege of, 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 of advancing the kingdom with. How cool is that? We no longer have those issues in our life because suddenly we begin to say, wait a second, Lord, I am having the privilege, the honor of every moment, everything I manage, returning to you. So Jesus said this. He said the kingdom of heaven is like, it's like great Christian stewardship. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your graciousness. Thank you for this church. I, I'm excited about what I'm seeing you do here. I, I, I truly am, Lord, and I, and I just want to offer a, a word of thanks uh, for that. Lord, I, I, I love my brother and sister, Kurt and Teresa, and so good to spend time with them. And, and so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful blessing to, 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 to be able to share your word from in this place. But Lord, let's be clear, this moment, this time is not about me. This moment, this time is about listening for what your word was saying and allowing it to convict us in such a way that we respond to you. That our response becomes our worship. Oh, surely we've sung before and, and that's appropriate and fitting and a great response to what you've done. But let's be clear, you call us to obey as much better than sacrifice. You call us to a place in which we hear your word and we respond to it, and you call us to great stewardship of our lives. We love you, God. Give us the courage of the convictions you've created. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.